Let's take a moment to consider where we are now on our journey together. In our last time together, we talked about the role of the state. And if you'll remember, the claim was made that you do need a state as a stable context. But there was also a worry that perhaps a state, in order to give security, may also take away certain things that might be important to us. And it is very much true that critics of Hegel worried about that development in Hegel. We've also looked now, and I don't think quite looked enough, at the notion of freedom. On the one hand, freedom could mean to be left alone. And on the other hand, true freedom might mean that we're in a context which supports and acknowledges us. After all, you can't be fully free if you're in a totally, totally alienated environment. But in all this sort of reflection and conversation that we're having, we haven't given close consideration to the notion of the self. Who would it be, who are we, that live in the state? Or maybe are in some sense outsiders? Who are we that are the kinds of people who concern ourselves with the creative life? and perhaps with reflecting on what history means and where it's brought us. Well, there's a certain conception of the self, of the person, that I'm going to call the billiard ball conception of what a person is. And this conception, the billiard ball conception, takes ourselves as distinguishable from all other cells, as separate items, you are you, I am I, each person is the person that that person is, that's been a very, very influential view in the course of Western thinking. What it suggests is that the journey of life, whatever it is, it's a journey that perhaps each of us make quite separately and that there is a very distinct difference. Call it an absolute difference between individuals. Now, this perhaps hasn't been dwelled on as much as it should be dwelled on, and that's because in some ways it's commonsensical. Your life is yours, mine is mine. We each go our ways, we may cross paths, we may do some things together, but basically each of us is a separate individual. So this billiard ball notion, as I've called it, so commonsensical, hasn't perhaps been given the consideration it deserves. In many ways it's hard to think beyond, it's hard to escape, and yet let's look at it more closely. Let's look at this notion that each of us is a single something that each of us is or has in our nature is a simple underlying unit. How do we get this conception? What makes it as commonsensical as it does? Well, it arises from common sense experience. Look, each of us has a separate body, a separate reality. You are somewhere hearing, seeing, perhaps both hearing and seeing me. I am where I am. When you see this, if you do, when you hear it, you will be somewhere, I will be somewhere else. That's so obvious. Why would we think beyond that? And it's our further experience that you know the content of your mind but not the content now of my mind or the people around you. They may tell you what's on their mind, but you don't necessarily know for sure that what's on their mind as they tell you is what's really on their minds. I mean, I hope what's on your mind is, well, this is enjoyable and intriguing and I hope I make some sense of it as we go along. 
And then what my mind has in it is, I want to engage you more in these ideas. But however that goes, your mind is your mind, you are where you are, my mind is my mind, I am where I am. The billiard ball conception, as I've called it, is given even further impetus by religious doctrines. Uh, religious doctrines that construe us as, among other things, either being or having souls that are distinct from our bodies, and the notion that each of us is responsible for our own lives, our own souls, and that if there is something like salvation or a beyond or a meaning of life, that you're responsible for yours and I'm responsible for mine. That reinforces this billiard ball notion. But it's even given further impetus by various moral and legal doctrines that stress individual responsibility and culpability. We are impressed with the notion that each of us is responsible for our actions. And we also have political doctrines that we talked about our last time together, and that is that we are separate individuals not to be interfered with. Yes, we can freely join together, but we are not meant to be interfered with otherwise. We are to be left alone and respected as the individuals that we are. And of course, in an entrepreneurial world, in a capitalist world as we know it, that stresses private property, the significance of individual initiative and opportunities for individual achievement and advancement, more and more we have this notion of the individual, the separate individual, an individual that may freely join with other individuals, but your body is your body, mine is mine. Your mind is your mind, my mind is mine. You will be held responsible for what you do. I will be held responsible for what I do. And if we put all those things together, it seems so obvious that we are separate and distinct individuals that I suppose you could even wonder why I've bothered to tell you this. Well, do I have something else to tell you now? I've just begun. And now we come to the complication, and we find it in an alternative doctrine provided to us by Hegel. It's very influential, and even when it's modified, even when it's rejected, it has had an extraordinary force in the history of ideas. It is the notion that we are not isolated billiard ball individuals freely choosing or perhaps sometimes forced into certain relations but nonetheless separate individuals. The doctrine that we see emerging in Hegel is that there are actually three dimensions that constitute our personhood or selfhood and what we're really concerned with is to look at these dimensions. Let's start with an obvious one that we've mentioned before. People have conceptions of themselves. They have images of themselves, ideas regarding themselves. And we can't live without them. We not only are people, but we are people with ideas regarding who we are as people. And what Hegel suggests is that the conceptions the ideas we have of ourselves are not extraneous, like clothing. It isn't as if we are who we are in our conceptions of ourselves. If we're lucky, we can change like we change clothes, uh, and they're external to us. The conceptions we have of ourselves, Hegel thinks, are intimately part of us. And what that means in part is that if we had different conceptions of ourselves, in some important ways, we would be different people than we are. Let's pause for a moment to think about this.
think of life as a journey. We are looking for the meaning of life, if there is one. Our selves are involved in this journey. But now we get the idea that maybe part of the journey of life is involved with understanding better the conception we have of ourselves. And perhaps then finding a way to alter that conception. The idea is if you know what your conception of yourself is, if it's possible to alter it, you will have become in some way a slightly different person. And it's possible that part of the meaning of life is that alteration of our conception of ourselves. Now we need to look at something pretty paradoxical in this. What Hegel believes to be true, and many philosophers, is that even if your conception of yourself is not in accord with you, even if it's a little bit ajar in relation to you, it's also part of you. This is the notion that self-conception is more intimate than clothing. And even if your self-conception is ajar, it's equally as much part of you as the you in relation to which it's a jar. Think about that for just a moment. That even if your conception of yourself was askew, that too, and almost equally, is part of who you really are. Part of what you really are isn't just the underlying something. Now, even if that conception changed to a different, equally, inaccurate conception. It would mean that to a considerable extent you would still have become a different person. So alterations in self-conception, accurate or inaccurate, whatever that might mean, well those alterations in self-conception make us different people. And that's well beyond a billiard ball notion of the person. Now there are three extreme cases worth mentioning, and that will help us understand better what we're thinking about. You could imagine a person so out of touch, having such a strange conception of himself or herself, that we would call that person psychotic. Now that notion that we could be so out of touch with ourselves that our conception of ourselves, deranged if you want to call it, would still be part of us. That's really hard to accept. There is another kind of person. That's the kind of person who we say has virtually no horizon at all. That's the kind of person whose conception of self hugs the self so much that we say that kind of person has no imagination, has no scope, has no self-perspective, has no sense of irony. So we seem to want to play between two notions, a conception of self so out of touch that we say this person is in real trouble, and a conception of self that's so close that we say what a dull, what an unimaginative person a person who is so one with self, as we say, no scope, no conflict, no stress, no tension. And if we're to believe people like Hegel, you need scope, stress, conflict, tension, to have that kind of dynamic self, as opposed to what I've called the billiard ball self, that matters so much to Hegel. There's one more case to consider in this notion that self and its conception of itself are equally important. And that's the notion of self-deception. It's a kind of the most intriguing case we could come up with. We say that many people are in self-deception. We also say that 
maybe we want to cure that. Uh, some people have said self-deception is fundamental to our nature, but have also said that uh, even though it's fundamental to our nature and it makes us human, we should try to cure it. Well, there's a further reflection on this that we want to think about a great deal. It's the idea that perhaps self-deception is the sort of thing that if it's not too extreme, but if there's a little bit of discord between self and its image or idea of itself, maybe in that middle ground a dynamism exists that is the potential for our creative self. And let's consider one other idea, and that is the idea that what we might want to do is peel away. We might actually want to peel away various conceptions that we have of ourselves. We may want to accept that whether self-deception or not, it is as a matter of fact the case that there are different layers we have in ourselves. We're not billiard balls. Whatever we are, there are different layers of self-understanding. But if you peeled things off, if you viewed even the journey of life as peeling away layers, where would you get? There's a fascinating account in a playwright, Henrik Ibsen. It's a Norwegian playwright. And in one play called Peer Gint, he has a notion of the self as like an onion. And you'd peel away, and you'd peel away, and you'd peel away, and you'd peel away. But in the end, there'd only be peelings. There would never be a core. Now, this we need to think about. We've talked about some complex things during our time now together. On one view, if you peeled away, you'd get a billiard ball. And you'd say, I finally found me. On another view, you wouldn't ever quite get to the billiard ball, but it would be there. But the kind of tensions, conflicts, problems that exist between the billiard ball and its various, sometimes strange ways of understanding itself, well, those would be the great things, the dynamic things, the creative things that make life worth living, that give it its dynamism. How to take this? What to say about it? Do we find anything at our core? Do we find something that's the real us at our core, the proverbial billiard ball? Or should we view human life? Is the journey of life always a tension involving a core and layers that are in or out of touch with the core, but in a certain curious way, almost better out of touch? Because in being out of touch, there's creative tension. That's a romantic notion that we've looked at. When we looked before at the Romantics, we had the notion of a life that sought unity, fusion, but it was built out of creative conflict. We've looked at Hegel and the notion that, oh, you embrace conflict, and life is bringing to life, out of death, great conflicts and experiences that need to be made living. But then, how do we understand this self? Is it, when all is said and done, a billiard ball? Is it a dynamic tension? Let us consider. Whatever we are as human beings, and I think on our journey together thinking about what life might mean, whatever is involved, a relationship is involved. And we've come to see that two of the relata are ourselves, and our images, our conceptions with respect to ourselves. But there's a third dimension, a very important dimension, and it comes into focus if we consider where our various conceptions of ourselves, our ideas, where they come from. What are their sources? What are the sources of the ways in which we experience and understand ourselves? What we see it comes through very strongly in Hegel. We've thought about it, 
and that various institutions and historical circumstances in which we find ourselves and into which we grow up, these contribute to our conception of ourselves. So that means if we were living in the Middle Ages, which we're not, then the circumstances of the Middle Ages would form in some degree our conception of ourselves. If we live in an advanced liberal democracy in the 21st century, that would provide many of the elements that would feed our conception of ourselves. We mustn't have the idea that our conception of ourselves just mysteriously bubbles up from within us. If we were to believe Hegel, it's not the case that it works that way. Our conceptions of ourselves, however much they are in tension with an underlying, maybe mysterious self, those conceptions of ourselves are partly generated, partly structured, partly constituted and given their fabric by the historical circumstances in which we find ourselves living. And even though they come about through other people, they nonetheless are involved in our own understanding of ourselves, and they are also part of us. And that means that in an important way, others enter into who we are. Had they made or were they to make social or historical or institutional circumstances differently than they did, we would understand ourselves differently. We would be different people than we are, maybe even different kinds of people. There's a view we haven't said much about, we need to. It is called by some historicism. It is the claim that our nature changes over time because of changes in historical circumstances. And if that is true, then the meaning of life would be a quest that would take on a different form as a journey in a different historical period. That is to say, if how we understand life is embedded in history, then the particular history of our time will determine how we construe the journey and how we construe the result that the journey is supposed to lead to. Now on the billiard ball model, that doesn't make sense. We are who we are. History happens, but it's external to our true nature. And importantly, very, very central to these conflicting views that I'm putting before you is a distinction between internal and external relations. There's a famous story, so famous it's hard to believe it's true, of a professor that once threw a piece of chalk over his back and said, now it was an all-men's school, this is many years ago, he said, gentlemen, I've just changed the coast of China. What he was claiming was, what's true of the coast of China is any truth about it. And I suppose the chalk went a few feet in one direction, so the chalk was a little closer or further from China. Everyone in the class laughed, but it was that professor's way of saying that Maybe all relations are internal, whereas most of the class, the gentleman would have said, oh my, when is the class over? Obviously the coast of China hasn't been changed. This is pretty nutty. But at the heart of this, of the heart of something like doing that, is the notion of what is really a relation you sustain, perhaps institutional, historical, that you think is internal to who you are. There are certain kinds of relations you enter into that are intimate to you. You may not create them, but they make a great difference as to how you experience yourself and how you see who you are. Whereas there are other relations that are quite external. Let us look now, take a pause and reflect. There's a notion that we see around us very frequently. I think it's a notion that has lived historically for centuries. We see it in magazines, 
we see it in all kinds of places, it's the notion that one could lose one's identity. Now, what does it mean to say that you could lose your identity? Well, if part of who you are is your understanding of yourself, and that understanding involves elements, nutritional elements, that are provided by your historical circumstances, then I suppose if you were put in a quite different environment, you would have lost part of who you are. Remember a little earlier I said there's the notion that the Romantics had that basically we are meant to be wanderers, that we are never fully, we should never fully try to find a home in this world. There's the notion that it's important to find a home, important to find an identity, but there's also the notion that maybe it is better to have abrupt changes that allow us not to get fully invested, fully involved in a certain way of being in a certain setting. That was a scary enough notion that I needed a drink. Uh, and this is water. What about abrupt changes? If we have and undergo abrupt changes, and part of who we are is how others have formed the world in which we find ourselves fitting, is it true that there has been some form of identity loss that has occurred? Is this plausible? On the billiard ball model, it would make no sense at all. Even on a model that says, I am who I am, maybe how I understand myself isn't perfect, but I'm not influenced by others and wouldn't allow myself to be, it wouldn't make sense either. But if you think of part of your life and part of who you are, part of your very selfhood is embedded in circumstances not of your own making, but in terms of which you nonetheless live your life, then this is a very important notion that if you are radically altered and taken from an environment that you have experienced as where you belong or think you might belong, you will experience identity loss. The language and experience of religion can give us examples of this. Uh, one example comes from St. Augustine. He writes engagingly about losing oneself in order to find oneself. And we know that that's a deep religious conception, that perhaps to find yourself you must lose yourself. But that might mean that what you need to do is lose one sense you have of your identity and come through being in a different kind of circumstance to reach a different sense of identity. And that would involve at least two things, an alteration of your deep connection with the world, and possibly as a result of that alteration in your deep conception of your situation, a fundamental change in you. These are complicated ideas, complicated to capture and to sort out. And what we will see soon is that numerous philosophers take parts of what we've been talking about today and reject them. And other philosophers take the parts that the previous philosophers rejected and say, these are the ones that matter we're going to see some philosophers emphasize that how we experience ourselves is fundamental. And we're going to see other philosophers say the historical circumstances, the political institutional circumstances in which we find ourselves embedded, these are what matter. So far, it's not been all bad if we measure this on an optimistic, pessimistic scale. After all, Hegel was an optimist. Kant, actually, 
was an optimist. The Romantics thought it would be a struggle, but one could be optimistic about the future of the human spirit. But optimism isn't the only story we can tell. We're going to turn now as our next adventure and our next journey together to a very, very pessimistic point of view. This is the point of view of a philosopher named Arthur Schopenhauer. And we'll have to be steeled and ready for this, because Schopenhauer will give us many reasons to think life as we know it is really awful.